you guys. Are you all ready? All right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the National Opera Center. I'm Laura Lee Everett, the Director of Artistic Services, and I am very happy to welcome you to the first event for the 2013-14 season. Um, this grew out of a discussion with our artistic committee that there were an awful lot of people out there in the world that wanted to know about getting into directing opera and what the real differences were and what the real truths are about being a director in opera versus being a director in theater or dance or any of the other myriad things that require direction. So I'm very happy to have you all here and I'll introduce the panel in a moment. Um, I would like to point out that if you don't already know, we have um, four other events like this that are considered professional development that will be happening through the course of the year for all manner of different folks. They are all actually part of a member event that is free if you're a member of Opera America. Um, individual membership is $75 and you get a number of other wonderful benefits. So if you're interested in that, please talk to me or one of our staff before you leave and we'll be happy to get you that information. We are joined by our live audience here at the National Opera Center and on the live stream around the world. So welcome to all of you who are watching online. Uh, if at any point you would like to ask questions online, please text them in. The information is on the bottom of the screen. And I would also like to tell you all that at the end of tonight's event, as a wonderful tradition at Opera America, there's always a free glass of wine. So please stay for an informal reception where you can also continue to talk with our panelists. We're happy to have all of you here. Um, let me introduce to you our wonderful collection of professional directors. I can read their names as well as you can, but Emma Griffin, Robin Guarino, Eric Einhorn, Tara Faircloth, and Garnet Bruce. Thank you all for being here. Very good. Thank you, Laura Lee. And um, I am very, very honored to be at a table with my colleagues. We often don't get to see each other except in the hallways at our various theaters when we're running back and forth and to have a chance to discuss um, how we got to where we are and hopefully help bring the next generation along. Um, Opera America asked me to ask you, our audience here, um, if who here is currently in a degree program or is about to be making a transition and looking for a degree program. So anybody here who is currently studying directing? So, okay. And uh, somebody who's considering transitioning into being a director and looking for a program. Okay, and then, so that must mean all of you are directors. Okay, so that's, <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> We've got our work cut out for us. So uh, my background, I came up through, uh, I was a choir boy, so I could read music, and then I worked um, on scene crew and stage management and came up through the backstage and then got to sit out front and realized it was a whole different ball of wax and telling stories for a living as an assistant. And then one day they're like, uh, you've got the rehearsal today, so-and-so's ill. And then you go with what you have and your assumed knowledge and uh, you make the trains run on time and then you get to do a little bit more of it. So that's kind of my approach into the piece. I was a history major and an English major, so I didn't major in directing, but um, all of that comes to bear with what I do. But Tara, a little bit about how you got to where you are. Sure, I actually began as a singer, um, except I was a singer who really hated singing. <laughs> I loved performing, but I hated singing, and I definitely hated practicing. So uh, I got all the way through my master's degree in voice, performance and my last semester I was kind of conned into directing a Baroque opera for by my early music professor and it really opened my eyes I didn't even know that it was possible I don't know who I thought got to do that but I didn't think it was me <laughs> um, so from that point on I basically just worked non-stop I didn't always get paid a lot of money but um, I sold everything I had and I moved into an Airstream trailer that's right um, for three years so that I could take every job in the world that came my way including prop managing for modern ballet company and stage managing this and that and um, yeah, the heavens just kind of aligned. I magically got into the Marilla Opera Program um, just a couple years after that, uh, the, their, their training program, and they have one director every year, and magically they picked me one year, so that was a real career kickoff for me. 
and, and the rest is history. <laughs> Eric. Uh, I also started life as a singer, uh, and uh, I was pursuing my undergraduate degree at Oberlin, and uh, I, as, as what I thought was a clever attempt to get cast in more operas, and I wanted the, the faculty opera director to know who I was, I went up to him one day when I was ASMing Cozy as a freshman, um, all as a means to an end to get cast more, and I said, I'm really interested in directing, could I take one of your seminars? He said, sure. Uh, and so it was completely, it completely backfired on me, and um, I fell in love with directing, and ended up pursuing a joint degree. Oberlin has a great create your own major program, and so I designed a directing major to accompany the voice major, and this was kind of waiting to see what the world would, would have for me after a graduation. And uh, I was pursuing both ADing, assistant directing, and performing out of college, and sitting in a chorus dressing room as a performer on a second show Saturday one day, putting my makeup back on, thinking, well, this is not what I want to spend the rest of my life doing. Um, and I just threw myself into directing um, and traveled all around the place, all over the place, and worked a lot of interesting jobs, and, um, and then ended up uh, at the Met, and uh, alongside Robin. And um, the rest is history as well. <laughs> <laughs> so I grew up in a theater opera uh, family. My parents were very active in the civil rights movement and they were part of a community theater group called the East River Players in East Harlem. And, oh, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and my uncle had moved from Ohio and taught music, um, actually my great uncle, um, in a place uh, uh, in East Harlem. And um, so that was a really, really um, essential part of my background. Um, with my parents and then my aunt Florence was assistant to Rudolph Bing, uh, child secretary really at the old Met. So I grew up going to rehearsals in both places. Um, and um, so by the time I was like 12, I wanted to be a stage director of either theater or, or opera. Um, and it was really, I was really, it was really an autodidactic experience and I knew I had to learn languages and I had to, you know, sort of master my craft and I went to um, Europe at the age of 17 and just started studying Italian and German and was sort of you know sent to watch rehearsals and you know please take care of this bear and came back <laughs> thinking that theater and opera was far more interesting there than it was here although I had you know I'd grown up uh, at the Met listening to these incredible singers but as a young person I kept my eyes closed a lot and listened and um, and only then started after a while to be able to envision the theater that I, I thought it could be. Um, I um, got uh, I worked as a stagehand at the Met at the age of 18, and then I apprenticed with Jean-Pierre Ponel and Bob Wilson. So two two directors on either side of the spectrum for a good many years, and just basically worked for free, followed them around, odd jobbed it, and um, learned the craft from from backstage. I ended up going to Bard College and studied filmmaking. And uh, where else could, where else really? could I go after all of that? And, um, <laughs> and eventually I got a job and as an assistant director. Uh, I had to, I needed health insurance uh, at the Met. And I, and I think they went, well, okay, we got, we'll hire her for maybe one production. And then when she tanks, we don't ever have to have her back. And actually, <laughs> um, it really suited me. And I think it was because at that moment in time, I didn't want to be an opera director. I wanted to be a film director. But I had repertoire, and I had languages. And it came very easily. And there's something really interesting about um, when you're younger about saying, I'm not going to do that. And then all of a sudden, it comes easy and doesn't. it didn't resist me. And I went, well, this is really interesting. Well, maybe I can be the kind of director I want to be in this context. And I was very lucky uh, to be given an opportunity to kind of learn my craft at the Met um, at a very important time when James Levine was doing all the Mozart um, operas and Ponell was still there. And I learned it from those two masters. And um, I really, um, it's interesting because this week um, Levine is back at the Met and I'm directing the Cozy and it feels like coming full circle. And it's such a privilege to see someone who has shaped the careers and really brought you know, operas like Cozy into the mainstream, whatever that means, rep. And so I had a very privileged opportunity to be part of that growth. So that's my, my story. 
Mine is very different. Um, <laughs> I, um, I grew up in theater. I worked in theater uh, from a very young age, uh, professionally both acting and directing through um, you know, elementary school through high school, and then I went to NYU as a theater student. And like most theater students, I thought I wanted to be an actor. Uh, and in my freshman year, I had a directing class with Robert Moss. And I, I mean, I actually remember the moment, and it was, ve it was like class number two of being like, oh, actually, this is the thing that I want to do. Uh, and so I started directing uh, at NYU and also in the city. And I, where I really grew up was in the downtown uh, theater scene in New York in the early 90s and through the 90s working with all those people where there was, um, I mean, there, it was okay to do things for no money and there was a lot of space at that time. Uh, and I had fantastic opportunities and I did all sorts of stuff. I ran my own company uh, for many years. I self-produced. Uh, I worked on all sorts of different things, but always on my own work. I've never assisted uh, and I have never, I've never gone that route. I'm also not a musician. Um, and because my proclivity as a stage director was towards uh, spectacle, I was interested in shows that had a lot of people on stage that were interested in kind of an epic sort of storytelling, that segued into musicals. Because when, in, when smaller companies were looking for younger directors who could handle musicals, you know, it, coming through theater right now, it's a lot of people who know how to do the three-person play, and I was someone who knew, how to, you knew what to do with, with 30 people, so I ended up doing a lot of musicals, which I loved. And that, uh, for all the same reasons, segued into opera. Um, and I think, again, in many ways, because when I was working with my own company, the other members of my company were designers. And I have always worked really closely with designers and have always been really interested in uh, the visual storytelling in tandem with what the actors are doing. And so that then segued into opera. And that uh, was sort of, uh, and that came late to later. I mean, I've only been doing opera for I think under 10 years. Um, and that is, it was sort of another one of those moments of, I mean, I kind of went into it with like, I have no idea what I'm doing. I've never been in this situation before. You know, everything I've ever done, everyone's been singing in English. Uh, and it was, uh, it was, uh, I mean, very much like my first directing class, it was a moment of like, this is fantastic. You mean there's music all the time? <laughs> uh, and I fell in love with it. And so then I've kind of been educating, been directing opera while educating myself at the same time and sort of, and keeping a foot in the theater world. So that's where I come from. Well, um, in terms of our next generation, um, one of the questions is where are the training programs these days? Um, I know that I didn't seek one out um, at CCM. There definitely is. Marilla, they have that one position. Um, Wolf Trap has apprentice stage directors. But mm -hmm. in your experience, um, w if you had an 18-year-old getting out of high school and wants to be an opera director, where should they go? What should they look for? Tara, any? I wish I knew. I actually have <laughs> zero knowledge about this. But I will say that they should look for a place where they can work. Not where they sit in class all day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is my words of wisdom. <laughs> okay, place where we can work. All right, Eric? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, like Tara, I remember going through the process of trying to find a program, d debating whether or not to seek a master's degree, and looking for those few opportunities as an apprentice stage director. Um, 10 or 15 years ago, Marilla was it. There was something at the at Canadian Opera Company. Um, and slowly, more American companies have been putting more stock and value in training stage directors. Um, but until recently, it's been neglected, unfortunately. Um, but the, the, the strongest program then, and I, I think now remains CCM, in terms of that balance of um, classroom work and, and practical work. Um, but Robin can certainly speak. Well, it's so interesting being head of a program when that was totally not the route that I took. I mean, I was, uh, it, I was all about experience and self-taught, and yes, you learn the material, and you learn the languages, you learn the music, and that's your sort of sword and shield, and you know, you're not supposed to know. You're supposed to say, I don't know, and let's mm -hmm. figure it out and all that, but um, to be leading a program now where I'm supposed to teach people how to do that. And I think my, uh, what we found, what I, I found now, because I'm going, I have my third director, and we take one director every other year, and we do that because we want them to be working all the time in different situations, like individual coachings, like main stage productions, like concert stagings, like, mm -hmm you know, choral semi-stagings, like, you know, uh, experimental work in a, in a black box theater. And um, I just keep 
pushing them into those kinds of situations. So that's why we take one. Mm -hmm. And um, there is a lot of independence because I want them to learn about producing and interacting uh, with different people. And um, there's, um, so I think it's a great program. I think it's a great program because there's a lot of opportunity. Um, and it is a performance geared program. Um, yes, they can participate in all the academic aspects that the university has or that the college has, like language study or, um, you know, history of art or any of those, you know, um, you know, aesthetics or whatever mm -hmm. that, you know, state, but um, it's, they also get to, um, it's a plastic. They get to mm -hmm. forge their own program and they get to, um, you know, direct across, across mediums. So some of them are doing musical theater, some of them are doing drama, some of them are doing choral things. Um, and we also are career bridging. We're pushing them out into, we have an opera fusion program with Cincinnati Opera, so they're going and doing uh, that kind of thing. So it's very much, um, it's not as academic as it probably once was. It's much more uh, performance geared. So finding a performance program at, like CCM may be something that aspiring directors would look for, the, the hands-on experience. Well, yeah, I mean, I think, I think that that's a really good route. Or, I mean, the way I did it was found a mentor. I yeah. found really interesting directors, yeah. artistic directors, music directors. I mean, I was very lucky because Maestro Levine loves working with young people, and yeah, he yeah, was yeah. incredibly generous. But I think it's about finding a mentor within whatever framework you can find it. And I think it's about working. Make your own work. Yeah. Do your own work. I, yeah. I, yeah, I mean, I think that... Uh, we're certainly in an age where there's too much focus on accreditation as opposed to experience. Right. And I think the experience is invaluable. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, and I, if you're looking, I also feel like if you're an 18 year old, go get a really good liberal arts education. Mm -hmm. Learn some languages, right. take some music classes, you know. Right. Learn, learn how to think. Learn how to <laughs> yeah. think, take right. some philosophy, some history, and then like just work. Yeah. You know, a little chemistry wouldn't hurt sometimes either, so. Sure. <laughs> right. and, um, I mean, I live in Baltimore and uh, when the Baltimore Opera folded, uh, suddenly there were nine small groups that sort of sprang up from young folks who were willing to do their own work and to get out there and to get busy with something. And have they lasted long or have they merged into something else? But for a while, they populated the landscape a little bit. Um, so um, maybe, what was the first show that you directed? Ah, oh, it was called Cain, Il Primo Omicidio, The First Murder. What a great show, right? <laughs> um, uh, Alessandro Scalati. It's actually an oratorio, but we staged it, and um, it was pretty amazing. And How did you get that job? Well, this was, this was my college uh, experience, okay. the one that I got conned into doing. Um, so it was with a early music broke ensemble, all professional musicians, and several professional singers and several university people that were in the chorus. But really, I didn't know what a gift I was given because they were like, oh yeah, I mean, here's, here's a couple thousand dollars and just make something awesome. <laughs> and so really, it was my first experience learning how to do, um, how to do something with nothing, kind of. Although $2,000, I was happy to have it. <laughs> um, but I was forced to be really, really creative. And so, yes, the first murder. Well, and Emma, you mentioned you know people who know how to do the three-person play, yes. and then <laughs> suddenly just not me, yeah. <laughs> right? And then and then uh, when you know what was your first opera project? Uh, flute. I did Magic Flute. That was my very first opera. Did you enjoy it? Oh God, I had a fantastic time. Okay. Although I'm really glad I didn't know what I was doing. Yeah. I mean, that was I was because what I knew I was a theater person, so what I knew how to do was tell a story. And so that's what I did. I mean, just at every moment, I was like, well, we have to kind of make sense of this, and I don't know why she's doing this, and this, it feels weird that this aria is here. Can't we move it? Um, <laughs> and no one said no, <laughs> including the maestro. So, um, I, yeah, so it was flute, it, which actually, I'm, you know, and now looking, now that I know flute quite well, and I've seen, I was like, right, that's a really hard one, but it's, you know, if you have to, like, trial by fire, it was fantastic, but yeah, I had a great Well, time. there's a trial by water, too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, God, the trials. Uh, <laughs> um, and Eric? Um, my first show that I directed was actually in high school. Um, in order to figure out if I wanted to be an opera singer, 
um, I formed an opera club in my school. I was that kid. And, um, <laughs> there was... Were you were so here in the city? No, it was in suburban New Jersey. Okay. Uh, and near the city. Uh, near the city-ish. Right. And so it was a 45-minute reduction of Carmen. And um, I got all my friends together, and of course I wanted to sing Escamillo, and it was great and wonderful, but there was nobody to direct. So I was like, all right, fine. I'll do it, um, begrudgingly. And um, it was not the greatest experience. Uh, I remember yelling a lot and being frustrated a lot and <laughs> realizing people don't listen to you when you yell and scream a lot in rehearsal. Um, you know, we got to the big crowd scenes, and I didn't know what to do. And, um, and there were my friends looking at me like, well, can we just go home or just go do something else now? And so it was, um, so that, that was that. Yeah, and that, that, right, almost mutiny. People wanted to walk, walk away from it. Um, it's, it turned it, but what I, what I came to understand from that was really the, the collaborative part of opera, which has brought me back to it again and again and again. And, if, and luckily, I've, um, after that experience, I've stopped yelling in rehearsal. And, um, but it did sort of open my eyes to, to what I love about opera, which is getting in a room with whether it's three people or a hundred people and saying, okay, let's do this together. Let's figure out what, what happens now and let's tell a story together. And Robin, you wanted to do a film. Right, I, and... did, I did films before. Um, so I got funding in Hamburg to make my first film, uh, which was called Crossing in the Atlantic, and it was bought by Independent Focus, and that was like astounding. And it Is this fiction, non-fiction, biographical? It's a kind of experimental, uh, biographical kind of thing. And so that was my first sort of like major career thing. But I mean, um, you know what I remember is that getting together with composers was like one of the things, that's really conscious in my mind is my early works. And the one of the first things I did was work with Ricky Gordon on um, a song cycle that we did at St. John the Divine with Harlan Blackwell and Angelina Rayo. And that was really exciting and wonderful And because it, it was in a different venue and these were great singing actors and incredibly generous and Ricky is amazing. So that was my first sort of conscious moment of opera. And, and, and it evolved from there. Yeah. <laughs> so now uh, many of us, Emma, uh, has not had the assist at the big house <laughs> kind yeah, of experience. Yeah, <laughs> but um, opera choruses, I mean, people who come from theater are often a little daunted when they're confronted with the chorus for the first time. Um, and do you have an approach or something that... Yeah, no, that wasn't daunting. So, <laughs> that's no. good. Yeah, I mean, I think, well, well again, musicals. Musical, I was going to say musical, yeah. so, yeah, it's the same but, thing. Uh, speak, speak. No, 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 you guys should talk about it, because I oh. have not... Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I love choruses. I have always really, I mean, you give me like 50 people to move around the stage and nothing makes me happier. Uh, it, it's a different, um, you know, again, the theater I came from because I self-produced was large scale. So I was used to the idea that there is a specific kind of storytelling about humanity that can only be achieved when you have a vast number of bodies on stage, right? Which is not something you're seeing in theater so much these days, but that's where I came from. Uh, so for me, choruses, it's just another way to tell the story. Yes, obviously, you have to solve problems of like you have three seconds of rehearsal with them and you have to get them across from here and they're cranky about their costumes and you know, there's all sorts of things that you have to deal with, sure. But if you can engage them in the storytelling, uh, and if you can engage their uh, sort of performative imagination in the uh, what you know I, your idea of what they're doing is, then I have found it to be a delightful experience, actually. Good. Yeah, Robin, your first chorus. I mean, uh, you grew up with the Met. Yeah, I mean, I love working with the chorus because they're, they're they're real professionals and they know the theater yeah. and they know the work and they mm -hmm. just want to do something really interesting. And I think. Um, yeah, when you're hooked into storytelling and you know those people and you, you engage in that creative spirit, it's great. It is daunting working in places like the Met where you know it costs so much money and you have, yeah. you know, at the time I remember doing a large chorus show and, and, and Joseph Volpe coming up to me and saying, if I give you five minutes more, you know, will that, you know, we'll and, knowing, and, we'll, and knowing, you know, if you took five minutes or 15 minutes, it was going to cost $10,000 and weighing that, yeah, it's a lot of pressure and you have to be prepared and organize and use their time well and, um, you know, but they're amazing and the power and the focus they bring to it, if you do greet them with a level of, you know, expertise or craft or 
performance is amazing. Yeah. I'm like, I was I was in a room with chorus people, um, members of the chorus three days ago, and they walked into the room, and I went, "Guys, you guys are so amazing!" And they were just, and they've been doing it. They've been in the nose all day, or you know, they, yeah, <laughs> long days, <laughs> and they were still disciplined, focused there, singing great. Yeah. Yeah, I think what what I love about working with opera chorus is 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 to remember that they are. Um, much like Emma said, they're they're viable members of these of this world you're creating. They're not. I think they're a lot of people tend to be overwhelmed by a chorus and think I don't know what to do with them. So you just come in, you stand there, you're happy peasants, and you're done. Um, but <laughs> the the for me, the more you can engage the chorus as individuals, and I remember that sort of there was a transition period where I um, started working with choruses a little more than I had previously, and I stopped micromanaging the chorus. I would have conversations with choristers and I would say, you know, look, I would speak to them as I would a soloist and explain the world we were in, explain what was happening, what the goal of what, of what we were all working towards, and I would, I was up front with them and I, I, I tell this to everybody I work with, I don't have all the answers, I don't know, um, which I think is a very important thing for a director to admit in a room, personally. Um, and the minute you engage somebody that way, um, it creates a different energy in the room. It's, they all feel responsible and part of it. Um, so I've just, and it's, it's made time management with those three seconds of chorus rehearsal you get anywhere in this country um, much more enjoyable. And it, not that it lets you off the hook as a director, but it makes, um, as opposed to having 10 minutes of music you need to stage with the chorus and thinking I have all these moves to give them and they're never going to get through it, if you explain to them what you're aiming for on a, on a more intellectual level, more soloistic level, I think I found that it pays, pays dividends that way. Actually, I was going to say, um, I've worked in large houses where we have professional chorus coming in uh, that, that you see every day ish or whatever. Um, but in regional houses, they're not professionals usually. They're regular people who've been working all day long teaching snotty nosed kids and coming to the opera because they love to be there. And it's a completely different energy and it's one that I actually find exhilarating. Um, I, I love working with those non-professionals that are there because they love to be there. Um, but it's interesting because the approach is very much the same. Even though they're not professionals, you know what, this is their company and they're going to be there long after I'm gone. And so they have so much more invested in making the show wonderful and, um, and so yes, approaching it the same way, it really involving them in the dramatic process. Mm -hmm. Although yes, once again, three seconds of rehearsal time, <laughs> that's the... That's always a fun challenge. Right, learning the time management aspects yes. of those yes. things. It's uh, that's you know when oftentimes you learn it as the assistant director, yeah. and right. um, that is one route that many people go into the world is you know shadowing somebody else or keeping the notes or being the schedule person, right? Um, and uh, is there something one of the things to, getting those assistant director jobs? What should people know or I mean going in as an assistant director? That's your first. Good luck. Oh, I wish. I wish. I wish somebody had taught me before I took my first AD job, AD job how to take blocking notes, um, and that you know because your your principal job as an assistant director is to notate the staging of the show, and the first show I assisted was Boam, and it was going along great. Act one, a couple of people, no problem. We get to act two. I'll never forget the chorus walks in, and there's my score in front of me. I thought, oh God, there's not enough room on the There's not enough room, and then the director starts going out, and as as we are wont to do in those big crowd scenes of giving couples and small groups individual tracks, and I remember chasing around, thinking, I don't know, I don't know how to write this down, I don't know how to keep up with that. It, it was just completely overwhelming. Um, so a good intro to to. Archiving staging, I think, would, it would have been really helpful. Of course, you learn quickly and you learn on the job and you figure out your own way of doing things. And I think that's the, that's the important thing with, uh, with any part of directing, whether it's assisting or doing your own work, it's finding your own way of, of doing whatever it is you're, you're looking to do. Um, Robin, any thoughts about? Well, you know, it's interesting because um, I think the longer you're a director, the more you develop kind of visual muscle memory. 
And uh, for me, it's always been rooted in the text. I mean, yes, it's also rooted in the structure of the music, and especially in Mozart, where there's an identifiable structure. You can decide to acknowledge that, use it, let it drive things, you know. Um, but I'm finding um, less and less the need to write anything down, and I think it's because we develop this muscle memory, and there is also a mastery of, of text and music, and you just learn that as you go along. And, um, you know, I wish earlier on I had mastered and really prepared the way I pr know that I have to prepare now. It's, you know, um, because I know that I'm, the, I'm, I love to be free when I walk in the room, free of the text, free of the score, and that only means, you know, for me it means memorization. Because there were too many times where I walked in and was trying to do flute or Act Four of, you know, Figaro, and my brain just pooped out because I'd been doing it for two weeks and I just couldn't, you know, there were not enough brain cells. So I just find for myself that the more I am sort of master of the text and the music, the freer I will be, and then my muscle memory really works well. And it's amazing watching uh, young people who are studying to be directors or, or even singers, um, they go into what we call the parallel universe because you know we're watching and they're out here and so whenever you cross that line and you go into the players field, it's, it, everything <laughs> flips and reverses. Yes. And it's amazing watching people and there are people who can watch something once and then in that world, in the text, do the quote blocking, whether or not that's what's important to you or, or not. And then there are people that can. And I have found that after having a certain experience with the text and the music now, I can watch something once and go up and there'll be like seven people on stage and basically go in there and do it. And you know, even to the point of turning right or turning left, because there's basically a basic sense and an order to how good blocking functions in relation to the text and the music, if that all makes sense. Um, and I used to also like not only go home and try and write it all down um, and, or look at a videotape and try and write it all down. Um, and I don't have to do that anymore as much, but it's also because I think you know you spend your life thinking about what is really blocking and what what is good blocking and what moves the story ahead, and what is just sort of this pinball flipper thing where you you turn in to sing, you turn out, you turn in, you turn out. You know what I mean? What really is good visual storytelling? You know. So um, that's a long answer yeah. to. So, well, now, and uh, coming from a more theater background, Emma, working with the maestro and the conductor, how have you found that? Um, I have found it incredibly freeing to not be the only authority in the room. Uh, it's really, uh, I mean, it's the best way I know how to say it. <laughs> I don't know. I know. I'm going to ask him. That was, oh, yeah, that was crowded. I don't know. Um, but no, I, uh, it was, um, I have been really fortunate, I would say, and that I've, uh, to this day, maintained really close relationships with all the maestros and maestros I have worked with. Um, and I have found it, maybe becoming from a the sort of more collaborative nature of theater, I don't know, that it felt like, great, it's another person to have a conversation with, but I have, I, yeah, I really enjoy that there are two people uh, and you can play off that and you can join forces and you can have a conversation. And it was also, for me, um, and again, I feel like I have been lucky in coming into situations where I, not coming from an opera background, where I had questions of like, how do we do this? And that being like a genuine conversation about the art being created. So I, yeah, it's been, that's been great. And frankly, yeah, it just, I feel like it's given me, it's one of the reasons why I like doing opera so much. It gives me a little bit of room that I don't have uh, when I'm doing theater, because it's just me. Good, now you get a chance to do, it sounds like, new productions. Most of the time. Oh, as an opera director, y yeah. I only do new productions. Which is great. Now, I only Tara, do my. I only do me. If that makes sense. Um, That's because all many I do. times in regional theater, you are assigned the two truck set that comes from Seattle and the <laughs> costumes that came from Canada, and so what's that like for you? Um, well, I have to say, um, there's two different kinds, versions of this. There is the regional kind where they just give you a set and you can do whatever you want to on it. <laughs> uh, and then there's remounting an old production, which is a different story altogether, which I don't like to do at all. Um, I would actually rather have my own ideas, even on somebody's old set. Um, I mean, one of the big struggles is looking at the props that are going to come with the show, um, because 
usually there's a box of props. And it's always like, what did they do with 12 buckets in Trovatore? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's always a big mystery. Uh, Where know. do those go? <laughs> yeah, what is that? Um, and then there's mysteries of, uh, wow, there's a little tiny door back there. What is that for? Um, and so, you know, really just deciphering someone else's vision and then deciding if you like that vision. And um, this is where your lighting designer becomes one of your very best friends. Uh, mm -hmm. Because the way the set is lit can vastly change the tenor of what is happening on the stage. And also, I've been very lucky in that most places, even if we are starting with a group of costumes, they're incredibly flexible in the places where I've worked, yay, to um, add to, subtract from, or flat out change a lot of things. So, um, yeah, so it's an interesting amalgamation of trying to decipher from the past, psychically, what happened before. Um, but, you know, it's not unlike working with many regional singers who have done their show many, many times um, in various productions. This is my sacristan. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, you know, they have ideas, as well they should, um, about how the role works and um, their place in it. And so that's uh, just kind of another version of that, I have to say. Um, trying to understand the depths of their mind and seeing what works for you, what works with everyone else, and making, making art on stage something beautiful. <laughs> right. I mean, my first Carmen was, here comes the scenery, and uh -huh. this is, you know, and you do try and do that math, and like, which one's the cigarette factory? Is it stage left or stage right? Yeah. <laughs> and, and then you make a choice, and then the set arrives in the theater, and you're like, I was wrong. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> like it says tobacco over there. <laughs> right. Um, and then you figure out how to do that. But, um, or ignore it or put something over it or your line designer massages Makes it out. Right. Yeah. So, now, you did allude to reviving someone else's work. And certainly, I mean, Eric, maybe you can speak to what's involved there. It's. It's certainly an interesting position to, to be in, in that uh, most of the time you've, you've assisted this person creating this production, uh, so you have a really good understanding of, of what their goals were and, wh and why things are, and you're not, um, you don't have to be so um, you know, archaeological and trying to, like you do with a, with a rented set, of figuring out why this is, this is the way it is. So you have a you have the primary sources available to you. Um, but then, like in any situation, any time a, a show is done again, you're going to have a new cast, or even if it's the same cast, they'll have had different experiences since the first time they did it, um, things they wanted to, to change or revisit based on the first performance. I mean, it's a whole uh, series of, of variables. And, um, but yet, you want to remain faithful to the to the structure of the original of, of, the, of what makes the production that, and so I think it's a really you take a case by case to say what makes this production what it is. Is it the fact that the the staging is uh, uh, sort of mechanical and, and choreographed and stylized, or is it the general feeling of the production? Is it what is it? And and I think once you identify that, you identify your superstructure that you can then work in. Um, and just create and tell the story with the people you have in the room with these th with these things um, The tricky part is when you get to that moment or moments in the production that you necessarily as a, as a director Maybe don't agree with or don't you're not into hundred um, percent Or the singer questions it, you know that I just I won't do this I, I think it's against the text against the music. So it's about either yeah, Mimi does not die in a chair mm -hmm. exactly yes <laughs> Um, well, and so you then, you have a choice. You can either, if you have a firm understanding of why the original director did that, you can try and explain it and, and work with the singer. If, but then you as the director in the room have a decision to make. How important is it for her to die in the chair? Or is it just as valid for her to die on the floor, on the bare skin rug that came from <laughs> Canada? Um, you know, whatever. Um, so, it's there is some there there is certainly less freedom, but I think there's more than one might 
assume in that sort of right. situation. Well, and uh, Robin, you mentioned mentoring with Pinnell and with mm -hmm. Wilson. Uh, yeah. I mean, and you revived the Lohengrin at the Met. I did. <laughs> so, and you had to put other people into that very complicated choreography. <laughs> well, it was an interesting situation because I was actually um, at, paid to go over and to research the production. And I'll never forget going into Z the Zurich Opera House and um, what, they brought me backstage and I walked on stage and I looked at the stage and there were 2,000 pieces of tape on the floor and um, with people's names on them and I just thought that's so totally weird and then I want, went out and I watched it and there were chorus people in these rigid costumes with, with these helmets and they walked on and they were all like looking on the ground <laughs> and I realized that they were um, they were looking for their spot and I was and um, <laughs> So we brought it back to the Met, and it took, you know, it literally took them weeks and weeks for them to find the spot, and, I, and that was a, it was a German assistant who had found this method. And we went back uh, at, to the Met, and I, I went, um, well, okay, there's going to be a wedge of chorus people, and let's <laughs> form an enormous piece of Swiss cheese <laughs> with holes in the middle. And they literally, they went up and they formed a wedge of people with like nice little spaces, and that was it. I mean, I'm, I'm joking now about it, but yeah, we had to recreate this idea, and um, the first year that it was done, it was very micromanaged. Um, um, I mean, I was more the bo Bob's point person in the house and there was a German assistant who came in and it was really this finger was in and that finger was out and it was just crazy and no one could breathe and it was just not well done. And um, the second year, uh, Joe came to me and said, listen, can you do this? And I, I mean, I knew Bob very well by that point. And we decided that we would, he, Bob didn't come back. We had conversations um, at the end of every day. We'd talk on the phone. And I put it together and I just said, you know, if I'm going to do this with singers, they've got to be able to breathe. And I just uh, believed in not a sort of static, but a more, um, you know, breathing, vibrating, you know, responsive uh, body. And so I did it on those terms and it, it really changed the whole thing. And, um, and it was a big hit that year. It was three months later and, and yet it was a much more vital breathing um, production and I think I mean Bob gave me a lot of credit for that and I think it was listen I love him and he's a he's an amazing director and that's why I wanted to to work I wanted to help him work with opera singers in that kind of a situation and I thought it was a really interesting and beautiful production and um, and but at that point in time he hadn't worked a lot with singers and didn't really understand how to get them to work in a gesture and with breath in a way that could get them to do the job they had to do. And so that was a special situation and it really, I think it, it brought it to life. And so then that as a mentor, you're, you know, somebody yeah. mentored and you're carrying it on and enlarging and in yeah, I mean, I think I learned a lot from him about visual, you know, his his visual world and his world of light and his way of listening to um, music and then seeing it in, you know, through in a visual way was really uh, amazing. And it was interesting because he came back and did notes the second year with me and there was a real, uh, it was a very interesting give and take as he learned how to, um, you know, sort of see what the pitfalls had been in the past about a rigid and a tense body, but um, to, you know, bring it into um, a singer body that could actually, you know, function. Because it needs to function. I mean, obviously they need to breathe and they <laughs> right. need to keep energy moving. Music needs to happen. They need to yeah. see the maestro. Yeah. yeah. And also so. Bob is not exactly a text-based person and he certainly didn't speak German in that way. So there were just things that we had to do in terms of singing the text that had to happen. It's a long story. Yeah. So. Nice. Right. Um, so, what should a director have in their tool bag? Is one of our questions um, about things that you know you would say that if you're heading into doing this for a career, what would be two or three things that you would say would be really helpful as we go along? Anybody have a language study? Language study from Tara. Okay. Patience. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, a desire for getting to whatever the truth of the story is and the situation of those people and, um, you know, um, and, and a, a love of experimentation and spirit of adventure and not knowing <laughs> yeah, everything. Spirit of adventure, yeah. Right? I, also, I would say um, a willingness to trying to say this in, a, in, an, in an open way, but like a willingness to kind of take it. Mm -hmm. Like to stand up and say, this is what I want, and everyone in this mm -hmm. room is going to be unhappy about this. And, I mean, you need cojones. Yeah, actually. you do. <laughs> yeah, that's what I would say. That's yeah. my answer. Right. I mean, Courage, confidence. It's really interesting, <laughs> yeah. though, because yeah. I think as a woman director, that uh, is a very tricky thing, yes. especially in the opera world, because, you know, it was interesting because recently someone said to me, and they only ever say this about women directors, well, you know, she wasn't very nurturing in the room. And like, when did they say that about men? Never. Never. never, 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 never. But you weirdly, I mean, in some ways you have to like trick people into think, thinking that you're being nurturing while you're like slapping Getting people around. to do what yeah. you want. Yes. I know, that makes me crazy too. You know, it makes me crazy. And I also have found that as a woman director, you have to know the material more, you have to know the schedule better. Yes. I mean, you have to not show that you know it better. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. But you have, you, there is, you there's have no to, room for error. There's no room for error, none. And there is a there is the the first five minutes in the room where if you especially you have a, an assistant and they're a man, that everyone is going to look at the man when they walk in the room unless they yes. know you and think that they're the director. Oh, I've had people think I was in the cast. Right, and so um, Actually, so yes. there is, and then, <laughs> and then there's like this little test that goes on to make sure you know the material, and it's a little yeah, yeah, game, yeah. and then it yeah. sorts itself out. Yeah. You know, I think well, that to speak to that, I mean certainly. The experience I would imagine is different for men and women directors, but also there's an there's an age yes. consideration that way also. Mm -hmm. That um, I was very fortunate that I started directing very young. That you walk in the room and people assume you're the assistant, or what role are you singing, or are you in the chorus, or are you a stage manager? Mm -hmm. yeah. No, I'm the director. Oh, mm -hmm. okay. Reset. Is this <laughs> is, <laughs> wait, you, is no. this your first Carmen? <laughs> Why, yes, it is. Oh. <laughs> so there's always, there's this, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. there's, the, yeah. even though we, as an industry, I think young singers are the, the exciting new crop of everybody, but God forbid a director shouldn't have a gray hair. Um, it's, it really, it's, it's interesting and it still happens. Um, you know, I think people just, there's always that, that first five minutes, there's always somebody jockeying for something, whether it's gender or age yeah. or experience. Um, so it's a tricky thing. So that's where the confidence and the, and and really knowing your stuff comes into play. Mm -hmm. True. Now, um, one of Corey's thoughts is you now have your toolbox and you have your skills and you, maybe you have a degree in hand. What is the next way a stage director gets a job? From there. Does anyone know the answer? Well, I mean, there are a lot of different ways. I mean, some people do assist and then they remount and then they're invited back. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, you know, one of the things I say to young directors is that you have to learn to produce and to self-produce. Yes. And even when you are not self-producing and you're working with a producing company, you're self-producing. You're self-producing <laughs> and you're working as a co-producer. Mm -hmm. um, because often you're casting, you're looking for co-pros, you're doing all that. So they have to have be savvy with that. Um, and the other thing is to look for to work with young composers or mm -hmm. anybody who's trying to do any to trying to workshop anything like Working with AOP or working with, um, you know, I worked with EOS Orchestra or early on or um, American Theater. Uh, you know, there are a lot of working in places for free or for very little money to bring somebody's work to the fore. Work begets work. Yes. I mean, I really believe that. And, yeah. I, you know, there's certainly times in my life where, and that goes in ways where you just say yes to everything. Yeah. You just say yes. Or you live and then in the there's times where you trailer. don't do that because you've burnt yourself out or you're like, I can't. And you have to also self-modulate that. Mm -hmm. I think that's really, really important because burnout is dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I just really, I mean, you just, yeah, work, 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 work. However, that translates itself. And I think, and I feel like from anyone I know or have seen, like that is, yeah, that's the, that's the best way. And, and you'll find your avenue. 
Right, right exactly. And to not be afraid to yeah. follow a different path that, especially with yes. directing, there is no formula. Yeah. Yeah. If yeah. we had it, I'm sure we... And also there's no yeah. formula now for anything. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, I talk about, I teach theater students, and I talk about this with them mm -hmm. all the time. Like, no, it, it is the Wild West out there. Mm -hmm. Like, no one really knows where any of this is going right, right. now. So make it up yourself. Right. Yeah. Well, Tell a story that's interesting to you, yeah. 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 Well, people like to define this is the way you do it, and if you assist, then you can't direct, and if yeah, you direct yeah. experimental things, then you can't do you know nonsense. conventional things, and it's all nonsense. I mean, really, yeah. are these rule. I mean, you can break every single rule. It's all about being challenged and being interesting mm -hmm. and being good to work with and being smart, and then you can do what you want. And it's really people choose what they want to do mm -hmm. and whether they do it well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Uh, well, we have about five minutes left here, and we want to know if there are any questions. That and yes, so. Hi, Gordon Ostrowski, Manhattan School of Music. I don't have a question, but there's a new uh, opportunity for directing uh, young people who want to be directors, uh, created by the National Opera Association, mm -hmm. and it's right. a right. application, yes. and it does include a stipend. I'm not sure when it's going to be up and running. You can go to NOA.org to find out about that. That's great. That's fantastic. Yeah, about new, that. so. And for those of you online, yeah. we're talking about NOA.org, and have a look. I wanted to ask how how you prepare to direct a scene. If you if you write down all your blocking ahead of time, or do you come in just with a blank slate and just create it in the moment, or what what your technique is? Emma, where we'll start sure. with Sure, um, I, I sort of do both. I storyboard pretty um, uh, obsessively in the. Um, pre-production stage with my designers uh, and sort of I have a bit you know and so I've blocked it all out and I have little diagrams and then I usually don't do any of that um, to be totally honest mm -hmm. so I mean that's I, which I think just translates that's my way of doing prep work that's my way yeah. of lear doing my homework and knowing it and then you I kind of come in and mm -hmm. usually make up something mm -hmm. new so, Robin, you have a scene to direct. I, um, well, you mean a scene in the context of an entire opera piece? Yes. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, um, I do this, I mean, I work really closely with designers, so we, I'm really clear about what the story is, what the, you know, what the language of the piece is in terms of physical mm -hmm. movement, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and um, also just how the space works, what are the rules of the space, and yeah. where's light, and all yeah. of that. Um, so, um, and I, I'm, I'm a big text memorizer and music memorizer. I mean, I, I like the day before I go in, I will sing the whole scene to myself, walking down the street, you know, thinking it through. I don't do um, blocking charts, but I do know how the space functions, and I have an idea that, like, this scene's gonna happen on the sofa, and then the maid's gonna come in with a tray of coffee and, mm -hmm. you know, from Starbucks, and then someone's gonna go, bum, at some point. You know what I mean? I'll have ideas that point along, but, um, so that's how I, I prepare. But I, as I said, it's like I really need to know the text and the music very mm -hmm. well before I go in and do a scene. Eric, do you have a? Um, it's a lot of text and music study. Um, I love doing research, whether it's historical research or you know our history research, some related research. Whether or not I use any of it in rehearsal, um, I just it, to me it gives me just a, a wider toolbox to, to draw from if I need it. Um, and I used to be the kind of person that would go through and notate every move, every prop that was picked up. Um, and sort of like Ron was talking about, you do it enough and all of a sudden, like if I go back to my early directing scores, there are you know, notes everywhere and mm -hmm. something from a couple months ago, there'd be a, you know, a word here that I wrote, a couple <laughs> things, a couple pages go by. And it becomes more, um, for me it's all about subtext and um, I'm, I'm very, um, Often, my if you look at my scores, um, it's as if a, a, a sailor had written some really awful, na naughty, terrible things in there. Um, <laughs> because I find in in the in the rehearsal process, in kind of getting people going to sort of um, be really casual and colloquial about it, and um, you know, to 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 get to the to the meat of what people are really thinking. Um, and if that often spins out into vulgarity, well then so be it. Sometimes it only gets, it's in my score, but it's, it is about just finding what that means in the text and, and, and the music. Tara? I have to say my approach is much like Emma's. I do a lot of storyboarding and then I throw it away. <laughs> um, unless it's a big chorus show and then I actually yeah. do a quite big plan. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like I did a Sweeney Todd with 
27 red chairs and I had a graph paper with a chair where those chairs moved on every single scene so I knew what was happening um I actually in a larger sense though I think it's because I have my singing background I get all my information not all of course a lot comes from the text but a whole lot of it comes from just the music itself so even before I know what the translation is, I actually spend a lot of time just listening. Unfortunately, my Italian is getting better and better, so now I know <laughs> what they're saying. Yeah. But um, right. More Russian opera. Right. Yeah. Hey, yeah. <laughs> before, before I knew languages as well as I do, um, just listening to the music itself and not even knowing what was being said was very, very uh, informative to me. And then as I added language, it, it's just another layer. So. Yeah, our visual storytelling. Right, yeah. More you know, questions. Oh. You know oh. what I was going to oh. say? I forgot to say, and I know you do this too, but I, I really use the model a lot and Dropbox, of yeah. course. But like, I, I will go through like moment by moment by moment with the designers with lights and take pictures of everything on my iPad so that I'm like constantly scrolling through mm -hmm. to remind myself where I am and what the look is and things like that. Mm -hmm. So I do use that. Mm -hmm. Smart. Great. Um, over here. About doing lots of different kinds of work and wearing many hats and doing different roles within theater. So, how do you balance that with maintaining your identity as a director and also kind of staying focused and zeroing in on that, if that makes sense? Or at what point do you kind of say, now I will not, you know, be a producer or a props person. I will just direct. Mm -hmm. I, I don't. I just don't think it works that way. Mm -hmm. Honestly, I think that that. Hi. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> um, I. Uh, I mean, I'm not. It's not to say that, like, right in the emotional moment of the scene, and we're figuring this out. Am I really worried about some of the more producerial aspects of whatever situation I'm in? But I don't think you can compartmentalize like that. I mean, I think that your job is there. You are there to run the room. You're there to run the show. You're there to get the show up. You're there for the show to feel exciting and mm -hmm. thrilling. And that means a, that is like a vertical job and a horizontal mm -hmm. job. And you, that just, uh, my feeling is that never goes away. Right. Because, Frank, you know, listen, you're always in the situation where like, oh, you have this amazing idea that's going to snow here and blah, 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 blah. And when they come back to you and they're like, we can't afford the snow. <laughs> you know? <laughs> right? Which, let's face it, happens all the time. So you also have to be, like, you can't just be like, but I want it because I'm an artist. You have to be like, okay, if I fight for this snow, it means I'm probably going to have to give up the costume conversation that I know we're having three weeks from now. So do I fight for the snow now or do I do the costume thing? Do I give this snow up so that I can get the thing? Right? So, like, that's a very practical part of the job and that's mm -hmm. part of the art. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm yeah. sure, yeah. yeah. So I don't yeah. think you can split them up. Right. You have to be present for, you have to think strategically in the long term, yeah. and you have to be present for whatever sort of challenge happens in yeah. the, the I mean, moment. You're constantly solving problems. Yeah. I mean, your job is to solve problems, be it a recalcitrant singer or the props that all of a sudden are 12 buckets, <laughs> mysteriously, you know? I mean, so you, that, you're, and you're solving it hopefully artistically, but you're also solving it practically. I mean, yeah. we are dealing with an incredibly practical art form. You are getting that sucker up on stage. And so you, yeah, I think you're always working in all those ways. Very good, I think we have time for one more, so. Oh, I, I, I was wondering, there's a certain kind of control that a director has in rehearsals and you let people do things and you let people work things out. But when you were dealing with comedy, do you find that suddenly you've got to make this thing happen at this point in order to make the scene funny? Do you, do you find that your sense of control becomes more specific and you really have to choreograph yeah. the yeah. show. Oh yeah, yes. yeah. I mean, their comedy yeah. is the hardest thing and I think oh, you have God, to be really so rigorous with it. It needs a lot of rehearsal. I mean, Charlie yeah. Chaplin used to like, you know, take do a thousand takes on everything. And um, of course, uh, you know, performers, you know, they want to be funny and then they perform funny yeah. and that's just not funny. I mean, <laughs> it's also, uh, I, I find, I don't, and this is true of opera and theater, rehearsing comedy is one of, I mean, I would rather stick knives up my fingernails. Right. Yeah. Uh, but then performing it is like delicious cake, but rehearsing tragedy is like, Oh yes, let's just oh, that's great. this all the time. I'll feel really sad, um, and then performing it is it's great. yeah. But so, comedy is so hard. It's oh like God, you're in the so moment. Hard. You're going. This is not funny. It's not fresh. No. But it, it has to be absolutely calibrated and rigorously disciplined, yeah, that, rehearsed, like, and 
over and over and over. structure has to be rock solid. And you have to know that there's going to be a long time where you hate it a lot. So yeah. And then one day you get an audience and suddenly it's going to be so You're much better. Yeah. yeah. It is really one of those things that you need that outside eye. That it's, you know, everyone's telling their own joke in this scene and they think they're funny, but it doesn't read as funny. No one's being funny. And so it's our job to say all of you yeah. are out of sync with each other, and yeah. that's, that's the painstaking process. Yeah. I'm, I'm here to say also as a director that I find that young directors, on the whole, do not use tech. <laughs> and they, you know, they don't edit and get rid of things or really uh. rehearse something. <laughs> they don't know that actually once you get to stage with an orchestra or with piano, right. that you actually have to respond to that scenery and that light and the yeah. reality of <laughs> what it is. Yeah, 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 and if it looks... If it just doesn't work, you, you can't like press it. it. Yeah, you gotta like fix it. Yeah, 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 when it yeah. says tobacco factory over there, you have to solve it. <laughs> so. you, can't, yeah. can, you can't stay connected to some idea of conceptual idea of what you thought was gonna be funny because you have to respond to the reality yeah. at hand. I will say, if there's anyone in this room who's moving from theater to opera, the thing that is going to shock you more than anything else is tech. Mm -hmm. You know, theater mm -hmm. tech, as I'm sure most of you know, is. 10 times longer than opera tech, mm -hmm. uh, almost 20 <laughs> times longer, and I'm not exaggerating. Yeah. So the first time I had to go through opera tech, it was... Painful? Surprise. It was just <laughs> shocking. Where's the rest And there? now, actually, it's very hard for me to go back. Now when I'm teching theater, I'm like, please, this is, we, it's too much time. You Aren't can we do done it yet? Time. <laughs> yeah, so that is the one thing I'll say to those of you who are doing that. Very good. Well, um, many, many thanks to Opera America for letting the directors speak a little bit. And I hope that any of you, if you have questions uh, there online, you'll write in and Opera America knows how to find us. And uh, thank you all very, very much for being here. And I look thank forward to you. seeing your work at thank some you. point. Thank so. you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, when we opened last year and celebrating being here at the National Opera Center for a year, we have all of these fun activities happening on Neighborhood Day, which is Sunday, September 29th. Please come. There's going to be opera pub trivia and aria jukebox <laughs> and stage combat demonstration and lots of food and other yummy things. And the Friday night before that is a celebration concert that will be here at 7 o'clock on the 27th that we just learned we are allowed to open up to the public. So let me know if you want to attend. For any of you who had questions you didn't get to finish asking, asking please ask these nice questions. Thank you all so much. I look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks, Marley.